So welcome to this uh, conference. I'm seeing the number of participants going up, so slowly trickling in. Uh, my name is Matthew Landry. I'm the director of the Observatory on Politics and Security in the Arctic. Welcome to this conference on the Arctic region in an era of uncertainty. Um, I'll talk a bit about the rationale. I think it's pretty obvious that the rationale behind this title. We all, I think we all uh, lived the uncertainty in the past uh, few months. Um, so today conference, we're gonna start today looking at political issues. Uh, tomorrow we'll be more focused on military issues and economic and social issues, including information. Um, and, you know, talk how the discourse is shifted or not on social media and the like. Uh, before we start, just want to thank the, the partners in um, uh, of the conference that made all of this possible. Of course, the Center for International Policy Studies at the University of Ottawa, uh, the Observatory of Politics and Security in the Arctic that I, I direct, but also the North American and Arctic Defense and Security Network led by uh, Whitney Lackenbaum. Um, also supported by uh, the Minister of National Defense of Canada through its MINES program, its MINES program and the Ministère de la Nationale et de la Francophonie uh, of the Government of Quebec. So uh, great thanks to, to all of them for their uh, support and making all this possible. Of course, we made an online conference today. The chance in my mind and the mind of, you know, um, of all of us to, to bring together experts also to, to allow a broader audience to join in and to make that accessible and we're talking before the conference just a few minutes ago thinking we are in four different time zones uh panelists and so a chance to bring uh, people from, from different parts uh of the world the arctic region to talk about these very important topics the rationale of all this came with uh, me and Andrew uh, Chatter talking about, of course, the impact of, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, and looking at, um, I think I heard that the expression kind of flow of we live in a post February 24 world, a post Ukraine world. Um, so of course, the discussion in our minds would be to, to understand what would this world look like for the Arctic region? What would be the consequences for the Arctic region? What would be the potential, the future uh, of, of, the, of the Arctic region in this post-February 24 uh, world, politically, militarily, economically? Maybe to think some things haven't changed that much. Maybe to think you know there could be other avenues of cooperation or for, uh, for state relations for different actors to play a role. But I want to talk more. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it to, to Andrew to uh, to moderate our first panel and to welcome our panelists. Thanks for joining. Great. Thank you very much, Matthew. Our first panel today is about politics in the Arctic region post February 24th. On February 24th, as we probably all know, Russia invaded Ukraine and created an international crisis in Europe not seen since perhaps the Second World War. It also created a crisis in Arctic governance. As most of us know here, the main international institution for the Arctic region is the Arctic Council, and it consists of eight countries that have territory in the Arctic, as well as six permanent participants. Russia has been the chair of the Arctic Council since 2021. The work of the Arctic Council continued after Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014, but not this time. On March the 3rd, Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, and the United States issued a statement that they will suspend their work with the Arctic Council because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Whether the institution will continue or whether it is finished is an open question. So my hope is that our panelists today can shed some light on what the future of Arctic governance might look like. And we have four very excellent panelists to start us off. Uh, so the panel will be for about an hour and a half, and then we will have a keynote address from Dali Sambodaro from the Inuit Circumpolar Council. Uh, on our panel, we have Gabriella Grishas. Gabriella is a PhD, PhD student in political science at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. She also is a member of NADSEN. 
Gabriella's research focuses on Russian studies, Arctic politics, decolonial securitization and critical security theory. A recent article about the future of the Arctic Council for the conversation was widely circulated and reprinted. I'm sure many of our uh, participants today read that article. She also co-produces the podcast Disrupt, which aims to introduce audiences to the critical school of theories and international relations. Previously, she worked for the Hague Center for Strategic Studies and the International Criminal Course. Secondly, we have Timo Koivarova. He is a research professor at the Arctic Center at the University of Lapland in Finland. His research interests include indigenous peoples in the Arctic, Arctic climate change policy, Arctic law, the Arctic Council, international interest in the Arctic region, and the possibility of an Arctic treaty. He is the author of more than 150 peer-reviewed articles, books, and book chapters. He's been very involved in the work of the Arctic Council, authoring many reports and briefing notes for its working groups, as well as the governments of Finland. Third, we have Tony Pennicott. Tony Pennicott was a MLA in Yukon from 1979 until 1995, as well as the leader of the Yukon New Democratic Party from 1981 until 1995. He was also the third premier of Yukon from 1985 until 1992. Since politics, he's been a visiting professor at Simon Fraser University, the University of Washington Canada Fulbright Chair in Arctic Studies, president of Tony Pennicott's negotiations, among many other affiliations. In 2020, he became an officer of the Order of Canada. His 2017 book, Hunting the Northern Character, is part memoir and part vision for the future of Canada's northern region. And if I can personally say, highly recommended, a very entertaining and thought-provoking book. And lastly on our panel, we have David Roddick. David Roddick has operated David Roddick Consulting since 2012. He's been a senior advisor to the Arctic Athabascan Council, an Arctic Athabascan Council delegate at Arctic Council meetings, a research officer with the Department of Canadian Heritage, a research analyst with the Treasury Board Secretariat, a senior project manager with senior project advisor with the Council of Yukon First Nations, and an intergovernmental relations officer in Yukon. He has a master's degree in Canadian studies and a second master's degree in anthropology, both from Carleton University. Each of our panelists will speak for five to 10 minutes. And then I have a couple of questions that I would like to ask. And then we'll have a Q&A from audience members. If you have a question, please ask it at any time. We'll collect questions as we go here. To do so, use the Q&A feature on Zoom and ask your questions at any time. We'll have plenty of time for questions. In terms of the order, I did a random drawing to determine the order to keep everything fair. And the order that I got was Timo, Tony, Gabriella, and David. So to start us off, uh, I'll invite Timo to give us some opening thoughts on this topic. Okay, thank you, Andrew, and um, kind of thanks to the organizers for this invitation. And also greetings from, from Robert in Finland. I'm going to say a few words about the immediate consequences of, of Russian armed action in Ukraine to the Arctic Council and also a little bit more generally. For a long time, we, we thought that the Arctic Council is isolated from broader geopolitical tensions, like when it was able to continue its work after the illegal Crimean annexation by Russia in 2014, even if the then chair of Canada did propose to other member states of the Arctic Council force the activities um, the other member states did not agree at the time. The Council was also, before we go to the, to the war, once again nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize on 2nd of February, just a little bit before Russian attack on Ukraine on 24th February. So on 3rd March, um, seven member states um, of the Arctic Council announced that they, they do condemn Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine and that cooperation with the Arctic Council must now be forced, even if Russia serves currently as chair of the Council. Same time, the A7 also expressed the importance of continued Arctic Council cooperation. Russia then regretted on 4th March the decision made by the other member states and emphasized that the Arctic Council cooperation should be isolated from tensions elsewhere. Russian chairmanship also informed that they will continue to implement their chairmanship program domestically. And this is the, pretty much the situation we are still in. 
in my view, um, the signal from the A7 is that the Arctic Council will continue temporarily without Russia. But of course, I cannot be sure of this. There is no signal yet. It is important to emphasize the Ar Arctic 7 uh, have not yet even excluded Russia from the Arctic Council cooperation. They have just said that they are now pausing their activities to seek some kind of solution to continue. This is a kind of frustrating situation also personally, even if I do think that this was the only possibility for the A7. As I am uh, also participating in the work of two working groups of the Arctic Council and also one Arctic Council project, which cannot now continue at the moment before we get instructions from the senior Arctic official. This reflects the general challenge that we are confronting that the Arctic Council has about 130 ongoing projects that cannot go ahead. It's six working groups and, and subsidiary bodies cannot function. So all this important environmental protection, climate change and sustainable development work is hostage to this overall tension that Russia creates by attacking on Ukraine and breaching the most fundamental rules of international law in a very crude manner. As I said, it seems to me that the most likely way forward is that the Arctic, A, Arctic 7 continue to work via the Arctic Council, even without Russia for the time being. It's also clear that as Russia is half of the Arctic, everyone are very aware that whatever interim solution is created, we need to get Russia engaged to Arctic, Arctic Council cooperation sometime in the future. This is not going to be easy. We now know that Sweden and Finland are pursuing the membership in NATO, an organization that Russian current leadership considers to be an offensive military alliance. However, absurd this view seems to, seems to me and to many of us. So it may well be that when Russia is ready to be invited back to the Arctic Council, it will face a council with all other members in this organization that it so hates. The difficulty of getting the whole Arctic Council to work as a whole relates also to the indigenous people's organization who have a very important role in the work of the Arctic Council as its permanent participants. They sit at the same table and, and the nation state meetings of the council and are carefully consulted by state on all issues. Three of the permanent participants, the Inuit Circle Polar Council, the Tani Council, and the Aleut International Association have parts of their membership in Russia. And Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples of the Arctic Triton has endorsed Russian armed action in Ukraine, as we know. In my view, the Arctic 7 will be able to continue with the Arctic Council structure, as it is not an intergovernmental organization, but an intergovernmental forum that was established by a declaration, not a treaty. The flexible structures of the Arctic Council make it sure that the current members can continue the cooperation without Russia with creative application of these structures during this interim period, and perhaps this will take, um, take uh, move, move ahead in stages. Yet, as Ivan Blum from the World Children Center has argued, and he's also one of the persons who was negotiating the Arctic Council back in 1996, have, he has warned that it would be wise for the A7 to continue under another banner than the Arctic Council for this interim period. Also because the Arctic Council has from the beginning operated on the base of consensus of its members, just to make sure that Russia wants to rejoin the Arctic Council. But we noted that Russia has already withdrawn from the Council of the Baltic Sea States, so it is clear to everyone that it's important to carve a place for Russia to rejoin the Arctic Council at some point in the future. And of course, the point in the future, it just cannot now uh, even predict. It's extremely difficult to now think of when this can happen, but I remain hopeful that this will be the case. Arctic is an exceptionally important place also for Russia. And I'm thinking that it wants to continue the Arctic Council cooperation at some point in time. Finally, 
Let's also remember that not all international cooperation will discontinue in the Arctic, uh, as we know. Arctic legal agreements will continue also with Russia. So global ones such as the Law of the Sea Convention, the Continental Shelf Delineation will continue. Also the future negotiations like the one BDNJ that has tried to pay and uh, enact tools for the for the um, governing the, the biodiversity in areas and national jurisdiction that also applies uh, in the Arctic Central Arctic Ocean to, uh, to the negotiations uh, of which Russia also participates. And regional ones such as the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Act, you know, a tough end of the fourth. I have just ended actually, this just ended about uh, one hour ago, uh, the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting. I, I'm, a, I'm a member of the Finnish delegation there, and, and, and also there, Russia did take part. So these legal agreements do carry themselves uh, uh, forward in these uh, difficult uh, times that we are now living. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a perfect uh, way to get us started. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'll turn things over to Tony for his opening opening statements, opening thoughts. First of all, let me say um, hello to my old friend uh, Timo, and um, I say that I agree with much of what he says. But I want to um, suggest a couple of things. Now, there's a way of a formal statement, but of a bit of a wander through recent history. I think it's important when talking about the Arctic Council to remember uh, the way in which it came into existence. Um, there was a fairly um, well covered speech by Prime Minister Brian Mulroney proposing such an organization not long after which we had the famous speech by Gorbachev in Murmansk proposing that the Arctic, instead of it being a Cold War battleground, be a zone of peace. That was followed almost immediately by Manu Koivista's uh, proposal that, um, um, that we should seize that moment created by Gorbachev. And that led ultimately to the Arctic Environment Protection Strategy, which in turn became uh, the Arctic Council. But in that same period, we also had a remarkable report for the United Nations, chaired by Norway's former uh, Prime Minister Roharlam Brundtland, uh, which made very popular in the Arctic regions the idea of sustainability or balancing economic and environmental considerations. And then you went on through the actual work of creating the Council with the Ottawa Declaration, with the Canadian Foreign Minister Lloyd Axworthy, and very especially Mary Simon, now Governor General of Canada, but then. Um, an Inuk politician who um, helped frame and support this creation of the uh, permanent participants that um, Timo talked about. As a um, former leader of a regional government in the Arctic, though, what was painfully obvious from the beginning was that the one interest that had been deliberately left out of the Arctic Council were the regional governments in the Arctic. And as Tom Axworthy has made the point, that was a great pity because actually the regional governments in most of the Arctic are in fact the people who do most of the governing in the Arctic. And that had a brief flowering, that fact had a brief flowering during the, the glory days of the Northern Forum, which has now fallen into, well, it's now a Russian-based organization and not, and not and has very few active members in, in the West. Um, and, and that's a pity because the really some of the really tough policy decisions about the Arctic are being made by regional governments. I would argue that the reconciliation with indigenous peoples in Alaska, Yukon, Northwest Territories, uh, Nunavut, um, and even Greenland has been very much led by northerners, not by people in the south. And the, that reconciliation between settler and indigenous populations in the Arctic has been the one really big character forming event in, in Arctic history. And it's one that's not really recognized by the Arctic Council, which is a pity. So if Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, leads to some rethink or even reorganization about the Arctic Council, uh, without uh, denying the current and important role of nation states or, or indigenous groups, 
uh, and remember, they're not governments, they're a political organization. So you have a kind of asymmetry, which we Canadians used to talk a lot about in constitutional debates, but is not talked about normally. I think the absence of regional governments is uh, an important um, element of Arctic governance, which needs to be included in any reformed Arctic Council. Um, and I think the, um, the fact that, um, that has, I think, changed uh, street talk, as I heard it just yesterday talking about Main Street and Whitehorse, was that while Canada, Canadians, based in the south largely or most of our population lives very close to the american border um are not aware of this but northern people are acutely aware that like Finns, we are actually neighbors of russia as are alaskans and that really does affect the security uh, thinking about security and um, which we don't formally discuss in the arctic council but as Lawson Brigham has always made the point, once you start talking about the um, Arctic um, shipping assessment, for example, which, which he was one of the authors, you are talking about security issues. And as those of us on the left like to realize that security isn't just about armaments, it's also in the Arctic, especially, it has uh, many dimensions, including food security, housing security, environmental security, and so forth. And we should, um, as Canadians understand that the fact that after the Alaska Treaty Settlement in 1971, which provided 178,000 square kilometers of land and a billion dollars to the indigenous people of that state, Canada has negotiated 20 some treaties in Northern Canada. Um, and those treaties have reinforced Canadian sovereignty, but also I think been major contributors towards uh, Canadians security where we have not met i think norad expectations is the fact that while well, there are 20 some thousand armed service personnel in alaska there are very few only a handful in places like yukon and i think that one of the things that it's a backdrop if you like to arctic council discussions but i think there's going to be a lively discussion in the years ahead in canada about um, not just armaments, but the question of Arctic security generally, and the fact that we have this big power for their nuclear armed neighbor, uh, not just next door in Alaska, but also in Russia. And, and um, what is the role that we and, and Canada and, and the other Arctic states, as Timo pointed out, seven of the eight of the Arctic Council members may soon be NATO members, Turkey permitting. Uh, and that is going to make Russia even less willing to rejoin, even as Timo emphasized, it is important to keep that door open. So let me just end on that note. Thank you very much. That's uh, that's wonderful and a very, very interesting, provocative uh, idea proposal. So thank you very much. I'm sure that will spur some questions from our, our participants uh, today. Um, okay, so now we will turn things over to Gabriella for her opening thoughts. All right. Uh, I'll just echo the other panelists to say thank you so much to the organizers um, for inviting me to be a part of the panel. I'll be talking kind of broadly about what I see as causes of insecurity in the Arctic today, focusing on the Arctic Council and what my views are and some options going forward. So to start with insecurity today, I think it's impossible to think about Arctic security without talking about two key things. The first, as we've all been talking about, is Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February of this year. But the second, and I think more important thing, is continuing insecurities on a local level from climate change that are existential threats to Arctic communities and people. So while it's not surprising that the situation in Ukraine has bled into Arctic politics, it remains an essential driver of insecurity and uncertainty in the region. And it's had political consequences, as both Timo and Tony have touched on, which, of course, I would say the most relevant is the recent NATO applications by both Sweden and Finland. Um, but beyond just this one event and its various consequences, Arctic militarization and increasing questions of traditional security are prevalent and increasing. Whether you look at Russia's focus on Arctic military modernization, the reopening of Russian Arctic bases, or the US's publishing of Arctic strategies across the Department of Defense. 
And this turn to military security in the Arctic is growing and dangerous, not only for global security, but for the security of people living in the Arctic as well. But while everyone is so focused on these questions of traditional security studies, I think we really lose out on valuable time to deal with the implications of climate change in the Arctic, which is also a political issue. Global warming is already causing significant harm to the Arctic environment, and that damage will only continue as temperatures rise. Not only is this impacting the real physical security of coastal communities across the Arctic, particularly in Alaska, where Alaskans are facing a reality where their homes are being lost to the sea, but it also threatens the food security of these communities and in turn their societal security, particularly for indigenous people who rely on traditional hunting practices to reinforce societal resilience. So as an example, a community who used sea ice to hunt in safer conditions may now face very dangerous seas, which may make it difficult or impossible to obtain their traditional food sources. And when these food sources are unavailable, it makes it hard for these communities to practice their traditions. Reindeer herders across the Arctic also face really serious threats to their security. Over the past two decades, reindeer populations have declined 56%, putting indigenous herders' ways of life under threat in Euro the European and Russian Arctic. Many of these herders see reindeer as central to their lives, both for their food base, economy, but also intrinsic to their very culture. Extreme events in the Arctic, like rain on snow events, where temperatures fall after a rainstorm and thick ice crusts over the lichen, which is a reindeer's primary food source, can and already has led to mass starvation events. Outside of this local level, increased shipping uh, due to the breakup of sea ice and the development of passages like the Northern Sea Route may also lead to further insecurities, such as the possibility of an oil spill or a similar ecological catastrophe that the Arctic can clearly not afford. Thong permafrost may also lead to radiological disasters and additional oil spills. And while this hasn't happened yet, increased economic attention, whether from shipping, oil and gas extraction, will may probably lead to problems in the future and should, should be addressed sooner rather than later. But turning to the Arctic Council, as you know, everyone here has talked about, we know that um, the work was paused when the Arctic Seven decided to step away. And very much it's a casualty of the war right now, although legal cooperation in separate realms is still ongoing. And while there's no question if this was an understandable response, it's very clear that if the West had done anything else, it would have been seen as legitimizing Russia's actions in Ukraine. However, while that was certainly understandable, it doesn't change the fact that we still need cooperation and communication on Arctic security issues, whether that's transparent communication on military exercises, or working together to combat the largest security threat in the Arctic, climate change. Even right now, studies on permafrost thawing, which is a key threat to Arctic communities and infrastructure, suffers from a lack of Russian data and Western scientists cannot work with Russia's climate experts and further Arctic resources. It's my view that giving up cooperation would be a mistake. Even in the face of Russia's blatantly illegal actions, we need to make sure that we avoid further militarization in an arms race in the region. Even during the worst days of the Cold War, the US and the USSR compartmentalized issues to make progress on scientific concerns and polar issues. And I think that we can and should apply that framework today. For example, during the Vietnam War in 1972, the US-Soviet Agreement on Cooperation on Environmental Protection was enacted. We certainly don't have trust right now, but what I would argue is that we need at least transparency on security issues from both a military security perspective, as well as economic, societal, and climate security. And in an ideal world, some small degree of cooperation could lead to more and towards a cooperation spiral that could lower tensions elsewhere. But looking forward, as for right now, we still have some diplomatic infrastructure for regional governments. And it's my view, that the Arctic Seven should maintain financial and logistical support for projects through the six expert working groups in the Arctic Council. And as it still stands, officials of the Arctic Seven should still meet and sustain a framework until the full Arctic Council is reactivated to prepare for when that eventuality hopefully comes. As both my panelists have pointed out, Russia makes up a pretty significant portion of the Arctic. And so leaving them out of Arctic climate cooperation in the future is really not feasible. However, Arctic governance and dealing with the many security issues in the Arctic cannot simply stop. There's no time for that in the face of climate change and Arctic residents should also not be casualties of the war in Ukraine. 
I think focusing on military security transparency is also key here with the main goal perhaps not being full cooperation, but at least preventing hot war in Europe from spilling over in the Arctic. And that, you know, at least should mean communicating on military activity and decreasing possibilities for miscommunication that can easily lead to miscalculation. In the long term, Russia's chairmanship of the Arctic Council only lasts until May 2023. Hopefully, the war in Ukraine will be over by then, or at least some type of diplomatic solution will be found. I'm certainly not suggesting that cooperation with Russia should happen right now, but that at some point in the future, we will have to cooperate over matters of common interest like climate change, and we shouldn't simply return to the status quo. The war in Ukraine has shown we need better solutions to these problems. I think that we can and should strive to create better institutions that more accurately reflect the current geopolitical realities of today. Whether that means finding ways to focus on military transparency, highlighting shared concerns on climate, or as Tony suggested, adding in representation for regional governments as well. Our goals here should be a focus on future security threats like climate change, because while the media and the world focuses on Ukraine, the consequences of that will continue to grow. And as we all know, the Arctic is warming three times as fast as anywhere else in the world. So I'll stop there. Uh, thanks so much to the co-panelists and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Also some uh, very interesting and uh, 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 well-delivered comments. So thank you very much. Um, and I'll turn things over to David to uh, end the a round of opening remarks. So David. Well, thanks very much, uh, Andrew. Um, hello, bonjour, and good morning, uh, and good afternoon. Uh, uh, and to my son, James, happy birthday. You're always in my heart. I'm speaking to you today from Whitehorse, Yukon, on the traditional territories of Kwanlin Dun First Nation and Don Quachin Council. Thanks for inviting me today on this panel. Uh, so in my foregoing remarks, um, I'm a bit in the position of Mark Antony and Shakespeare's play Julius Caesar in respect to the Arctic Council. Uh, my interest here is uh, uh, I come here to uh, bury, bury, them, bury it in a way uh, uh, rather than praise it. Um, the challenges Canada faces in the Arctic are not the same as it faced in the days just before the Arctic Council was formed at the end of the Cold War. This impasse instead looks more like the events of late 1940s, at the beginning of the Cold War, when the Soviet Union broke away from its allies, ending one of the largest military coalitions in history. At that time, Canadian Chief of Staff General Charles Polk could confidently assert, quote, the security of the Canadian North can be maintained with the expenditure of minimum of effort, so long as we keep it undeveloped. Today, global warming has fundamentally altered the Arctic as a geopolitical space, as Gabriel pointed out. Moreover, Arctic Indigenous peoples, by virtue of their international advocacy and national treaty protections, are now key players in this space. So what's happening at the Arctic Council? As Tima observed on the status of the Arctic Council, uh, in late February, uh, well into the second year of the Arctic Council chair, Russia decided to invade Ukraine. Um, and in a way, this is a play in, uh, within a play because Arctic uh, Russia has done this before, of course. As a consequence, the other seven Arctic Council states announced they'd boycott for future meetings under the Russian chairmanship. Recently, the Norwegian foreign minister has confirmed plans are underway to resume activities of the Arctic Council in 2023. As well on this subject, Mr. D. Hart, uh, the regional government coordinator, or regional Arctic coordinator for the US government, said there will be no initiative to replace the Arctic Council and the Arctic Council will return in its original format. Other Arctic Council members, including the Arctic Council's indigenous members have issued statements respecting Russia's invasion. However, it's the Norwegian and the US announcements that I believe speak, at least in terms of the current situation, um, uh, what's uh, what's on the table at the moment. Um, however, uh, Mr. DeHart's oblique statement about reconvening in 2023 in its original format raises many questions. As Tony has raised with respect to the role of subnational governments, there are possibilities of reform the Arctic Council format, and we should not miss this opportunity. 
uh, notwithstanding Mr. DeHart's comments. Uh, one is certainly that we, one question is certainly we, to relinquish the Ar Arctic stage to Russia for the next, um, next year in a self-imposed exile as Timo has alluded to. Also, as Tony has mentioned, how will the Arctic security interests be addressed? If not the Arctic Council, if not, is the Arctic Council at risk in descending in 2023 into a crude Cold War pantomime of its former self as the UN Security Council unfortunately has become? Perhaps we should be talking about what is Arctic Council or what will Arctic Council 2.0 look like long before May 2023 and how and when and with whom might this discussion begin? Uh, secondly, why is this crisis happening? I believe two seemingly unrelated decisions, the Arctic Council member states, are at the root of the crisis. And here I'm speaking as Mark Antony would. Uh, and although they began, all these, uh, these initiatives began as promising uh, ones, over time they have worked to undermine the authority of the Arctic Council and paved the way for the security crisis we face today. One is the uh, the first of these decisions was the 2008 signing, 2008 signing of the Lucia Declaration by the five, eight, eight, five of the eight Arctic Council member states. This initiative on the fringes of the Arctic Council table led some of its members off to explore the uncharted waters of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea process. Because only Arctic Ocean coastal states were invited, Sweden and Finland were excluded, and also Iceland based upon a technicality. Indigenous per permanent participants were not even consulted. The Elusa Declaration has left the Arctic Council members divided amongst themselves. The impetus for this declaration was a false flag event staged by Russia. Its most famous explorer planted a titanium flag on the seaboard, seabed floor of the beneath North Pole. Curi curiously, the North Pole and South Poles are the only places on Earth whose spatial coordinates are, coordinates are a null null nullity. However, this irony was lost on the Arctic Council member states, including Canada, who decided at the time to view the gesture as threatening. The Elusive Declaration, far from underscoring the exceptional nature of the Arctic Council as a zone of peace, unearthed hidden insecurities. It introduced animal spirits back into the Arctic Council, which were supposed to have been exercised together with security matters. No one seemed to ask if and when the objectives of the Elusive Declaration were ever met. Who was to provide the necessary security guarantees? Um, the second ill-fated decision, in my view, was to create a freestanding arm's length Arctic Economic Council, originally conceived as a circumpolar business advisory body, an Arctic Chamber of Commerce, so to speak. It quickly became a transnational focal point for Arctic businesses and investors for lobbying Ar Arctic states. Today, the Arctic Council, which has morphed into a 21st century equivalent of the mercantilist board of trade it has become a hotbed for arctic it has hobbled the arctic council as a priority setting forum for arctic social and economic issues infiltrating its agenda and replacing itself as the arbiter of such matters and on that score i think we really have to look at what russia the chairmanship has done and plan perhaps and you'll notice the arctic Economic Council uh, did not abstain from uh, meeting in St. Petersburg in the Arctic International Forum. Uh, it only abstained from meeting in person, uh, which means a few of its delegates did not uh, were required to participate digitally, which raised in my mind questions about where the Arctic Economic, stand, Economic Council stands on the invasion of Ukraine. In summary, Whatever form and shape the Arctic Council's response to the current crisis may be, it must be very at least reconcile itself with the fact that it has been the author of some poor decisions in the past, which have unleashed disabling centrifugal forces, which we are experiencing today. Finally, what have we missed here and what are we not seeing? Whether or not you accept the above thesis, one must acknowledge that the Russian second invasion of Ukraine occurred, mid, occurred midway through the Arctic Council chairmanship. That is no coincidence and a cause for further, further reflection. Um, as Gabriella has brought to the fore, global warming is the foremost driver of change in the Arctic, even uh, with respect to security interests. 
And we need to seriously question Russia's commitment to the Paris goals. However, we need to compartmentalize, compartmentalize these issues and demonstrate Russia can prosper within the agreement's goals. In summary, uh, the Arctic in the Council in the past few years has been courting irrelevance, uh, by which I mean misplaying its strongest suits, consensus and cooperation. The Arctic Council has contributed to the likelihood of a new emergent security ties Arctic to the detrimental of all peoples on the planet and most especially the Arctic indigenous peoples. Um, and with that respect, uh, uh, in that respect, I think a renewed and revitalized and strengthened Arctic Council 2.0 remains not only our best option, but our only option. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much to David and thank you very much to all of our panelists for some very interesting and thought provoking remarks. Um, I, uh, I had some questions prepared, but as I expected, those are going out the window because I have some, some questions I want to ask based on, um, based on the comments thus far. I see a couple of questions in the Q&A, so please add your questions, uh, questions now. I think I'll ask a couple of my, my own questions, and then we'll turn to the questions that are in, in the Q&A box, so please, please add those now. Um, I have a question I think for all of our panelists, I think is a I think is one that I've been thinking a lot about, and that is uh, when the Russian-Ukraine war ends, and we hope that it ends very soon, how soon do you envision the work of the Arctic Council or the work of Arctic cooperation resuming? Right away, or uh, will Russia have to meet certain benchmarks or do certain things before, before the work resumes? Um, perhaps I'll start with Timo. Uh, how, how soon do you envision things resuming hopefully when the Russian-Ukraine conflict ends very soon. Yeah, so I think that, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, I think that we have to kind of separate between, between the, um, the immediate situation and, and, and obviously we, we don't know even how long this war will, will go forward, unfortunately. So there is a time now to try to find some kind of practical solutions as I pointed out, there are the 130 projects and all the subsidiary group, group work in the Arctic Council that is that is now you know not not happening. So, so there is time to kind of make decisions on uh, kind of interim solutions, and I'm quite confident that those decisions actually have to be made quite soon. So that's my my take on that. For the kind of longer term, kind of in terms of when and how Russia can can re-enter, that that that's a little bit kind of out of you know the, the future horizon is, is so open. So that that's my my answer. Oh no, fair enough. I think that's uh, I think that's a very good point. Well, Gabriella, um, yeah, what what do you think about this? Sure, I think it's a hard question to start with, um, but. I think a lot of it depends on how the war in Ukraine eventually ends. You know, if it's a Russian victory, I think it will be much more difficult um, to restart co cooperation versus that there's more of a negotiated um, settlement between European powers, all of that. I think it will really depend on how Russia spins the information in that sense. You know, does it want to return to similar Arctic cooperation? In that sense, I think it would be much easier, um, but it's a difficult situation to imagine right now. David, do you have uh, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm I'm definitely of view uh, that um, this isn't just happenstance that we're in the situation. Uh, this is a replay of the 2014, and um, we should really be thinking of uh, of uh, of uh, what Albert Hirschman said in his book uh, uh, Exit Loyalty and Voice about you know this self-imposed exile that we're in waiting till 2023 what about all the observers out there tony mentioned what about all the other aspirants to the arctic council uh this could wither on the vine like a grape if we don't uh use this opportunity to rejuvenate it thanks i have a question for all of our uh all of our uh, panelists have a specific question uh so maybe i'll start with david uh after that uh, the comments after that uh that comment um, it sounds like that you're envisioning revising or perhaps expanding the mandate of the 
the Arts Council. So is that the case? Do you envision expanding or rewording, reworking the mandates in some way? Um, yeah, we, we can't do that without Russia at the table. But we can, as Tino said, the A7, uh, come together with the observers and talk about that sort of thing. And I think we have to shift, uh, pivot, uh, use this opportunity to give ourselves, empower ourselves. Uh, great, no, I, um, I think I'll, I'll turn to, uh, I have a question for Timo and also uh, Gabriela. Um, and that is how detrimental is it not to have the Russian data or contributions if the Arctic Council's projects are to continue in some form and if it's uh, just the Arctic, the other Arctic seven, how detrimental is it not to have that data and those contributions and are there projects that you can think of that in particular will, will really suffer? We'll start with Timo. Yeah, that's a <clears throat> very comprehensive question because it also deals with a huge amount of, of scientific projects that are now now kind of have had to kind of remove the, the Russian segment uh, from, from their um, work. So um, also in the Arctic Council, obviously it's a very science driven work. So, so obviously it will have a very clear impact um, I don't have any any kind of um, more concrete examples uh, in mind. I, for instance, in, in the in the work that I'm uh, involved in uh, related to Central Ocean, we, we do not have Russian participants in our project. So that's a protection of the Arctic Marine Environment Working Group project. So, so that's the one one issue where where obviously we would need to have also Russian participation uh, for. Also, kind of synthesizing data on how the central ocean is kind of transforming and uh, um, because of climate change. Gabriella? Yeah, I'll echo Timo. It is, I think, hugely uh, problematic that we don't have this data right now for dealing with questions of climate change now and in the future. As for specific projects, I'm thinking more of a specific issue in terms of permafrost thawing um, in the sense that there's just so much more of that happening across the Russian Arctic now and having that data would be hugely useful um, in places like the US and Canada and across the Arctic um, just for seeing perhaps you know how that will look like in the future um, in their own shores. Can you speak to Gabriella? Uh, I was at a different different event, and uh, they were talking about some geographers were talking about the fact that um, a lot of the uh, data from Russia uh, hasn't been and, and all around the Arctic hasn't been gathered in um, in two years at this point because of the pandemic. Um, so that kind of two year suspension in certain projects, okay. plus the these mm -hmm. suspending in the future uh, is going to uh, it's going to be further detrimental. Do you, have you heard about that? Can you speak to that at all? I didn't know specifically about that, um, but I can only imagine, you know, if it's already been two years that either we don't know what data is there right now, and that's already a huge gap in our information at the time, but hopefully, you know, by the time we get that information, we'll be able to see sort of the extent of global warming across the Russian Arctic and be able to better predict these situations elsewhere. Great. And Tony's back, so that's great too. Um, the hazards of uh, the digital age is internet connectivity problems. Uh, every class I teach has uh, has issues. Okay, so I we have a lot of questions coming into the coming into the question box. So I will I will turn to the audience. Uh, this question is from Bridget. Um, please give an example or share the name of a regional government. Tony, could you uh, perhaps elaborate on uh, the governments you mean when you refer to regional governments in the in the Arctic? Well, let's start with the ones you know best. Obviously, um, Alaska is a pretty significant entity, and it's the place that gives uh, the United States a role in the Arctic and in the Arctic Council. Um, the Yukon Territory, the government that I know best, um, has uh, almost all the powers of a Canadian province without technically being a, a, a brother or sister of confederation. Uh, the Northwest Territories and Nunavut, and Nunavut is interesting because, of course, it is in fact an Inuit government. Um, most of the MLAs and the bureaucracy, and in fact, its its worldview is very much an Inuit one, as is Greenland. 
another regional government, which is on its way to becoming a nation state, um, but which is still, uh, if you like, supervised and external and, and uh, military matters by, by Denmark. Um, even in a small way, if I could use the example, um, the, in, in the Finnmark Act, which Norway passed, borrows from Canadian indigenous settler co-management regimes to provide that legal uh, framework in its most northerly county, Finnmark, where uh, Sami people and uh, municipal councillors um, have uh, both have voice in land use and resource planning decisions. So again, to repeat the point I made earlier, the, the land claims settlements and the self-government agreements such as we have in the Yukon and Northwest Territories have profoundly changed governance in the North. In fact, if you look at the self-government agreements in the Yukon, just let me make this point, there are no federal powers on the table, but those agreements are really about sharing a power between the territorial governments, originally settler administrations, and First Nation governments um, in a way which I think has never, never been done anywhere before. And our uh, innovations, I think, in public policy terms, which are profoundly important, not just for Northern Canada, but I would argue for the, the Arctic in general, because I'm not predicting any massive change in the way things operate in Russia, but even where Timo lives in Lapland, there's a Sami population and there have been significant efforts towards reconciliation there on the same lines that has happened starting in 1971 in Alaska and then continuing in the Yukon and Northwest Territories and none of it after that. And with, with, with treaties, treaties that concluded in, uh, in 1992, and just let me mention this because Sometimes people assume that the Northern treaties in Northern Canada and, and the United States uh, in Alaska uh, resemble the 19th and 18th and 19th century Indian reserves and little pockets of land and permanent poverty and, and if you like, imprisonment and poverty, but they're not. They, the lands held by indigenous people in Alaska, Yukon, Northwest Territory, none of etc. are privately held lands, but in honor of indigenous traditions, they're collectively held private lands. So for example, the First Nations in the Yukon have more land in their land claim settlements than is contained in all the reserves in all of Southern Canada. The Nunavut, uh, the Inuit in Nunavut, as you know, own 350,000 square kilometers of land collectively, which makes them the largest private landowners in the world. So these are transformative events which I think um, happened, I think they, the, the fact that they happened made it possible to create the permanent position, the permanent participants were all in the Arctic Council. We have another question that would be good for Tony to answer as well. This is from our attendee, John. Picking up on the points about revamping the Arctic Council in light of changing political realities, how do you ensure the rights of indigenous peoples are respected? For example, bringing in regional governments while giving a voice to Northern residents could be seen as a threat to the role of programming participants, especially given the influx of the Vizera states in recent years. Well, I would argue that that question um, demonstrates a certain amount of uh, lack of knowledge about what's happened in the Arctic. The, the government of Greenland is an Inuit government. The government of Nunavut is mostly an Inuit government. The government in the Northwest Territories, where the where population is 50% Dene and 50% settler, is very much as much as it can be a Dene government. In both Yukon and Alaska, there are indigenous cabinet ministers, indigenous legislators, indigenous senior public servants. That was not the situation 50 years ago. Timo wants to get in, huh? Yeah, Timo, go ahead, yes, please. Yeah, just, just to also kind of um, complement what I said in my kind of uh, opening remarks. I think that it's important to, to realize that the kind of reality of the Arctic Council, the regional intergovernmental uh, forum, not an organization. And having been built on not only the consensus of the member states, but also the permanent participants. So this has been the kind of name of the game, even if they have been they haven't been kind of members. Um, factually, um, the member states have always consulted very uh, rigorously 
on what the permanent participants are thinking. So I, I do think that the kind of solutions that we are trying to find in terms of going forward, there has to be some kind of solution also uh, how how the permanent participants are are, are parties to this. Uh, in terms of the regional governments, I have personally proposed this, that, that perhaps it would be a bit of pre um, a Ukraine war, um, that perhaps it would be best way to, to kind of try to integrate regional government, which I think is important uh, to have a kind of Arctic Council catalyzed arrangement, an inter international organization like not the Arctic Economic Council, which is not part of the Arctic Council, but can assist the Arctic Council in its work. That was pre-Ukraine pre, uh, war, that was my thinking then. Great, and Timo, we have a question from, uh, from Matthew, my co-organizer, so I have to make sure we get to this question for sure. Uh, how can, and this is also for Gabriella, so I'll turn to Gabriella next. And the question is, how can the A7 cooperate together at the Arctic Council without Russia? Would such a move spur a forceful reaction from Russia? Maybe the creation of an alternate alternative form. I can go first. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I think, I think it's difficult, but I think it's necessary right now as the situation stands that there has to be some degree of cooperation between the Arctic Seven. Um, I think, at least from what I've read online, that the Arctic Seven is kind of cooperating in a very informal manner right now. Um, and I think that informal cooperation is probably the best bet to avoid a more forceful and aggressive mood because I think the creation of a separate forum would really be a mistake. Um, because, you know, as we've all spoken about, Russia is such a key part of the Arctic region. Um, so I think maintaining that informal cooperation is the best bet for now. Yeah, thanks. thanks. It's, it's, it's a very difficult uh, question. And I don't, I don't think that we can foreclose any, any kind of reaction. So, so we are talking about very kind of unclear reality ahead of us. I think Evan Boom was very, in Arctic today, he, he made an, an opinion piece, and, and I think that he wisely said that you have to somehow be able to craft this kind of interim solution in such a way that Russia is not kind of you know fully humiliated. And then there have been uh, scholars arguing that that um, this will lead to kind of further consolidation of of Russian and, and Chinese cooperation in the Arctic and perhaps in the Indian as well. I don't I don't see much. Much kind of signal to that effect. There has been obviously this kind of very loose strategic alliance between Russia and, and China already for some time, um, internationally and, and and to some extent even in, in regionally. But, but I, I just don't see much movement to that direction. And and um, I would be surprised if if uh, Russia would somehow would like to somehow create an, an alternative forum. But as I said. It's very difficult to foreclose any um, kind of trajectories at this present moment. I think I'll uh, give a question to to David. We have a couple. We have a, a question for David in the chat, which is: Can you please say more about the way the Alulasat agreement has undermined Arctic Council work? Well. Um... In the first instance, it, uh, I mean, we have to look at the origins. Uh, uh, the, the, the titanium, Russia's titanium flag on the, on the bottom of the, the seabed and the reaction to it. Uh, the reaction to it uh, was to bring some Arctic Council uh, state members to, with Russia to propose the, the declaration um, as, a, as an, a, an attempt to desecuritize the situation. However, you can't, in terms of a performativity, uh, desecuritize the situation when it's actually, in fact, an accommodation. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, and so the declaration itself was wrong-footed to begin with. It reacted to a threat, and unfortunately, uh, it divided the the uh, the Arctic Council member states amongst themselves. Most interestingly, 
it uh, dumped Iceland out of the forum. Iceland, who uh, sits uh, abreast the uh, Greenland, um, Iceland, UK gap, the critical, uh, critical security defense corridor for accessing the, the Russia. And the, to that, to say that that wasn't in Russia's interest for that to happen uh, uh, would be naive. Um, also, um, just the simple fact that at that moment you introduced the animal spirits, the great game, uh, territoriality. And um, the Arctic Council is always, uh, and the Arctic is contrasted with the Ar Arctic treaty system, our Antarctic treaty system as a treaty based approach to an area uh, for, for various reasons. But uh, obviously it divided the Arctic Council uh, members amongst themselves and had them more focus more, uh, more on their own individual interests and in security interests. And at the end of the day, no one seemed to ask, and I think Hillary Clinton asked this in a roundabout way in saying that the Arctic Council should be have all the members there, is um, who's, going to, uh, who's going to provide the security guarantees for the, the declaration at the end of the day? is something like really a fundamental question that was not asked that we're all asking ourselves today about the Arctic. Thanks. Can I just- Timo, Timo, go ahead, sir. Yeah, just, just a couple of things. I, I, I do interpret this uh, quite differently. So, so you lose a declaration and, and the, the, the kind of follow-up conference in, in, in Canada, they kind of, um, uh, Hillary Clinton came out of the second meeting and said that, okay, we cannot anymore meet in this way and we cannot challenge the kind of kind of the Arctic Council as a as a kind of uh, the, the 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 preeminent intergovernmental forum understanding intergovernmental forum a general intergovernmental forum for the Arctic. So this kind of uh, challenge did I think kind of go down. There was not real threat from that. I think that the Arctic five have done useful work in terms of fisheries agreements. So, so they did the kind of lay the lay the groundwork for for that particular treaty, which 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 became the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement. But it, it hasn't really challenged the Arctic Council in any general way. And I would also take issue with this uh with this kind of a uh, uh, Russian planting of a of a flag. I think that I think that we have already the scholarly community discussed a lot about that and. It was, a, it, was a, it was a misunderstanding that related to these kind of continental self entitlements and, and kind of putting limits to, to where the, the continental shelf can can uh, can uh, be uh, progressing in, in the Arctic for the literal states. Thanks. There's a question in the uh, in the, in the chat for I think for all of our uh, panelists, and it's a question that I have as well. I was planning on asking a version of. So the question is, what is the risk of the Arctic Council failing as an institution, given Russia's increasingly belligerent stance and negative response to Finland and Sweden's applications to join NATO? I was wondering about this myself. Um, if Finland and Sweden are successful in their NATO applications, um, you have seven NATO members in the Arctic Council and one non-NATO member. So would Russia even participate in the Arctic Council in that scenario? Is this all the moot points? Would Russia pull back from Arctic cooperation if it found itself as the only non-NATO member in the in the region? Um, maybe Gabriella wants to start with that one. Gabriella? Sure. I think, you know, with fear of being seen as an optimist, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that the Arctic Council would not fail as an institution. And part of my reasoning for that is that the Arctic for Russia is such an intrinsic key, you know, characteristic of how it sees itself on the international stage. And I think it, it knows that as well. And that's very clear in its document, how it portrays itself. And stepping away from the Arctic Council would be a really large humiliation in that stance. So there's sort of a balancing act Russia, I think, has to play here between don't want to work with only NATO members here, but at the same time, having that access to sort of Arctic governance is, I think, so important for Russia that I would hope that they wouldn't see a successful bid by Sweden and Russia as the end of the Arctic Council. Yeah, let me turn to Timo, who's nodding, and then Tony, and then David. 
Yeah, I think that it's it's obviously it's a it's a difficult to to fully understand um, uh, the the Russian stance is that that NATO would be somehow uh, an offensive organization and, and, a, and a kind of threat to Russia somehow. But this seems to be the thinking there. I think that it's important to remember that Russia has been undertaking cooperation with NATO countries in the Arctic Council for quite some time. So let's not forget that. And, and why is this so military security issues are excluded from the mandate of the Arctic Council? And I think that it's also important to, to remember that Finland and Sweden are from 1995, they have been members of the European Union, which has its own security clause. So basically, it says that the other EU member states need, do need to come to assistance if somebody attacks on Finland or, or Sweden. So it's not like that, that Russia would have thought that, okay, Finland and Sweden are kind of totally neutral countries. So let's also not make that mistake. But I do admit that uh, there are some some gray hair uh, growing in my hair as well because of that. Uh, Tony? Well, let me come up this question, from, if, if you like, to a rear door. Uh, Gabriella mentioned earlier on, before I was unavoidably absent from the conversation, uh, permafrost. Now, the two great emitters of permafrost in the world are Canada and Russia. Um, and behind them are Alaska and Greenland. And most people talk about permafrost thaw in terms of a problem of CO2 emissions, but a much more serious problem is the methane problem. But also in ancestral terms, uh, as one indigenous scholar here has pointed out, for indigenous people in the Yukon, permafrost was kind of their concrete the base on which they, they operated and lived for much of the year. And I would argue that absence the Arctic Council or some entity like the Arctic Council in which with Russia in the room, there would be very few four available for talking about that issue, especially between Canada and Russia or Greenland and Alaska and, and Russia at, without the Arctic Council especially if I can make this point as a norther, neither Ottawa nor Moscow seem to be doing anything to address the issue. And David? David, are you there? Possibly speaking, but muted. Didn't take, you know, we should be careful what we say uh, and think about uh, a rush on this, uh, you know, not, you know, just George Keenan's long memo of uh, thinking them as, uh, as uh, in a, in a, you know, one view, uh, obviously that their interests are our interests in the Arctic and they are looking for a path and we have to come up with some proposal that is at least as good as the one that they've suggested with uh, a Russia-Chinese axis to uh, uh, more or less ignoring uh, climate change. Um, as I remember uh, a, uh, a Russian delegate telling me in a meeting uh, using the, 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 the parable of the, the sun and the wind uh, trying to take the raincoat off uh, uh, an individual, uh, they they don't they see that there's not a problem with the adaptation. You, as the, the the gentleman said to me, uh, we will tell them and they will do it. And unless we want, if we're going to put something on the table with them, and it has to be economic uh, as well as, as social and political, it has to be better than what it, the proposal they're facing they they have on them facing them now. Um, and so we need to find a way to that. And I think. Um, we talked about project activities at the Arctic Council, but the Arctic Council, uh, they're doing fine on the science side. Uh, on the socioeconomic side, it's, as I said, the, AE, the Arctic Economic Council is more or less the arbiter of what, it, you know, the, 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 the ceiling, uh, which for us in Canada is the floor um, for how these projects and things will proceed. And that includes, you know, proceeding in a, in a, in a green and 
ESG consistent fashion, uh, we need some bigger, we need to offer Russia uh, something bigger. Uh, so as, as you know, Nietzsche said, uh, you can only, uh, you can break a promise if you offer a bigger one. And that has to be global and economic in its vision. And I believe that's part of the package that goes with the environmental, um, political and governance considerations. Thanks. Yeah, Tony, go ahead. Well, let me just make one suggestion. I just continue on, on the permafrost issue for a second, but and picking up from what David said about finding new ways. Um, and this is really Timo's turf more than mine, but let me suggest that one Arctic Council invention that could be extraordinarily helpful here is the University of the Arctic, which has 200 member universities, a large number of them in Russia. So at a time when it's very difficult for us to talk to Moscow about day-to-day -day things, it seems to me that we've already begun a conversation. Uh, I had last year, I hosted a meeting between an, in, uh, an a, a, a physicist, a scientist, a climate scientist, if you like, and a group of indigenous people, because they weren't talk, they were talking over each other's heads and not connecting with each other. And we needed to begin a conversation. And that was continued at the Arctic Circle in October and now become, may become a thematic network in the University of the Arctic which means Russian scholars to, could connect and engage with uh, those of us in the rest of the Arctic who are interested in permafrost questions uh, and perhaps start to develop some better understandings of the science and the challenges there. I'm told, for example, that Canada has massive amounts of data on permafrost, but it is badly aggregated and so people can't use it. But it seems to me a thematic network on permafrost through the um, Yukon, um, the Arctic University um, and the University of the Arctic, pardon me, and which is a kind of a, a, a child of the of the of the uh, Arctic Council. Even when the Arctic Council is not working, that network should be able to operate. Uh, maybe Timo would, because he knows more about the Arctic University than I do. But it maybe is a useful tool. Timo. Yeah, sure, and, and I guess that at this stage, it's also very difficult to kind of um, go forward also in, in that that in that institution simply yeah. because also the, the educational institutions are very much um, I think forced because of the current situation to follow the government line. So it, it's a kind of um statement, but in the longer run, I'm sure that it, it's gonna be in education, science, certain rescue where where we can progress. I think that we shouldn't also kind of think, and I was trying to kind of uh, um, kind of close my, my opening remarks with this idea that, that not everything, not all cooperation has stopped. So we have all the UN cooperation moving forward. We have Russia, I don't think that they are withdrawing from the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, so, so they are part and parcel of very significant process is still, however weird it sounds now, but that's that's the reality. So I think that these, these legal ag agreements have the kind of um, good side in them, I think. But in these kinds of situations, perhaps there is no trust, but in the course of time, Russia will join. And as I said, I was just testifying the under city consultative meetings and Russia was there, we had some problems, but but it continues to be a, a party to that regime. So um, I think that we have, we have to also kind of think and, and realize that many of the issues of the Arctic are being and only can be resolved in global level, like the Paris Climate Agreement. Well, we have uh, several more questions uh, in the in the chat, and uh, I hope that we get to all of them. But uh, I think I might use my. Uh, my chair's prerogative and ask a question of my own because it's a question that I really want to ask and I've been thinking about it a lot. So it's kind of a selfish question because it's something that I've been I've been thinking about and I'm I'm, I'm curious if we have thoughts about it. Uh, so far, we've been talking about the future for the most part, but uh, my question is about is about the past. Uh, 
And it's specifically about the reaction of the Arts and Council to Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014. There's been a number of op-eds. There was one in the New York Times the other day that said that the world community did not react strongly enough to the annexation of Crimea and that it partly emboldened Russia and led to the situation that we're in today. The work of the Arctic Council after Russia's annexation of Crimea um, pretty much continued uninhibited un, un, uh, after that, um, be, uh, after the annexation, the work of the Arctic Council continued and uh, scholars of international relations, uh, commentators often commented that, that was a good thing. It shows that uh, arts of governance is resilient and strong and cooperation can continue even as uh, cooperation deteriorates in other areas. Uh, perhaps uh, the more, those uh, uh, more in the liberal school of international relations, uh, thinking that cooperation is always a good thing. And I certainly made that argument and wrote, wrote some articles along those lines. But I, I, I've been thinking whether the reaction of the Arctic, the, the Arctic Council, the states in the Arctic Council to Russia's annexation of Crimea um, emboldened Russia even a little tiny bit, even, even, a, even a small bit. If the reaction in the Arctic Council should have been stronger back in 2014, uh, if a different path should have been taken. So I'm, I'm wondering if we have any, have any thoughts about that. Uh, I'm not sure who, who to start with, but uh, maybe, Maybe I'll start with Timo smiling. So maybe I'll start with, with Timo. Maybe Timo has some thoughts on this. Yeah, obviously I, I've, I've, I've um, pondered this myself. And, and uh, as I said uh, in my opening remarks that, that Canada was proposing that the Arctic Council would take a pause. So, and there were a couple of meetings where I think the, there were some problems in especially Canadians to, to take part. Um, I think that we shouldn't forget that uh, all the security cooperation with Russia was ended at the time. So this chief of, chief of uh, defense, um, um, defense uh, leaders, uh, Arctic defense leaders, they were, they were um, ended and then also the, the Arctic Security Council, Council wrong, round table this kind of larger setting that Russia pulled out of that. So, so that kind of, um, at the time at least, showed to many of us the, the good side of, of the Arctic Council, that it can continue in this difficult situation um, to deliver on those important values, climate change, environmental protection, sustainable development. I think that it's a kind of, um, it's very difficult to, to kind of say it, I think that it's also important to remember that there was a heavy duty kind of um, sanctions regime from all the seven other member states to Russia. So I would also say that the Arctic Council cooperation is also not you know, as prominent and as important as some other, uh, um, uh, especially from the national uh, government's viewpoint. So, so it is this kind of doing important work, but it's an intergovernmental forum. It has not been founded on its international treaty. It cannot enact any legally binding um, 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 decisions. So, so it's also important to kind of kind of see that that there are some forums where uh, one can move, especially when military security issues are excluded from the mandate. Yeah, I'll turn to uh, David. Maybe David has some uh, has some thoughts. David's unmuted, so perhaps you would like to go next. Uh, yeah. Um, well, it's important to remember that uh, uh, after the initial reactions, I mean, Canada uh, was uh, quite concerned about uh, researchers working in the Arctic, and they even banished some uh, some Canadian academic working on uh, Norwegian activities uh, or Vikings in the Arctic. The uh, but apart from all the reaction, what concretely happened, uh, I mean, one line of, of uh, history is that uh, in 2013, the Karuna Declara Declaration came forward with a proposal for a uh, circumpolar business forum, which was Canada's proposal, which they came to the table with in 2015. Uh, but it was preceded by a Swedish proposal to introduce corporate, so, uh, corporate social responsibility guidelines into the SWG. That got dumped. Um, 
And uh, the proposal for the, the Circumpolar Business Forum uh, eventuated in the Arctic Economic Council. So clearly what Canada's response to uh, threats of uh, aggression, and I think this goes back to what Tony maybe said with respect to initially with Brian Mulroney's offer on the table was let's get together and do this properly. However, where is the Arctic Economic Council today? Uh, they are still active and running. Um, they've, uh, you know, they just did not attend one meeting in person, but also um, it's part of the key activities of what we now call the Russian, uh, the uh, Russia has their Arctic International Forum, which is the forum that's still over taking over the Russian chairman pro program. This is the Arctic uh, a territory of dialogue. And uh, the Arctic Economic Council is a key player on that. Um, and what we see has morphed out of that is this vision of an Arctic that uh, is, is, is moved into uh, with the Russian and the Chinese dimension so that we're, we have the potential here of a bifurcated Arctic, an Arctic with a Russian Chinese axis and a sort of a Nordic Atlantic axis. And, and so, uh, so to me, this is the, the genealogy of this whole process it certainly begins with our response to uh, Ukraine. Yes, we were reaching out and making an offer in economic development. What we've come to today is um, an alliance or an axis with uh, where Russia and their international forum, uh, International Arctic Forum believes that maybe they can go it alone with China. And we have to respond to that in a vital way, I believe. Thanks. Great. Um, Tony, do you have uh, some thoughts on some thoughts on this? Well, <laughs> I'm fascinated by the prospect of the Arctic Council being replaced by an organization of near Arctic states, but um, I, I don't think that I don't think that has legs. Um, Russia is going to find friends where it can, but I think um, my my preference would be to still invest in the Arctic Council, but understand that. Um, well, I think um, Oliver Grimson said this great line, which I've frequently quoted, is the problem with the federal states in the Arctic is their capital cities are a long way from the Arctic. And in fact, they're not just a great physical distance, they're also an enormous psychological distance. And until you bring the both halves of the northern community, which means the regions and, and the indigenous people together as representing the Arctic interests, um, through the Arctic Council or other bodies, I, I think um, we, we're going to have a problem of, of communication and distance. And Gabriella? Yeah, I think I, I've also often wondered the same question about 2014 and the Arctic Council, but that also begs the question for me, but what about 2008 and the Russian-Georgian war in that case as well? And I have seen little about that particular comparison. I think, you know, echo, echoing Timo, not every international organization, um, whether it's treaty or by consensus, is responsible um, for responding to the situation in Ukraine in 2014 or today. And part of, you know, the uh, origins of the Arctic Council is that it is supposed to be separate from military security issues. And other uh, responses were done in other Arctic organizations. And I think that's, you know, that's the way we have diversity of these different governance structures. And that's part of the benefits of that diversity, I think. Right, we have about five minutes left of our panel before our keynote. Um, so there's a question here that was the first question that was asked and I haven't asked it yet. So I feel like I have to ask that question because uh, I guess this person had their question in right away. And I think it would, might be a good question for Gabriella. And the question is, is global food security a larger and or immediate, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll read it again properly. Is global food security a larger and or immediate threat than climate change? Yeah, I think those two issues, you can't disconnect the two. Um, climate change is obviously intrin like intrinsic to global food insecurity and it's creating insecurity issues globally, but particularly, you know, we're on an Arctic panel, so in the Arctic and I'm, thinking of traditional hunting practices of indigenous uh, people who now have to go much further into the ocean to get these food sources that really contribute to their societal resilience. Um, 
yeah, I, I can't, you know, leave it any plainer, I suppose, than to say that they're just connected. You can't have one without the other. Okay, so I have to pick a, we might have time for one or two more questions. So I have to pick some, some really good ones here. Um, I have a question that came in that I think will transition uh, nicely into our, our keynote, and that is about Indigenous governance. Uh, as climate change opens up Northern Territories for resource exploration and trade routes, it seems the economic bargaining power of Indigenous peoples will shift, yet exposing them to more predatory global economic interests. How do you envision Indigenous communities protecting their resources, and developing stronger infrastructure? And is there a concern that larger state interests, even Canada or the United States, could overwhelm Indigenous sovereignty? Perhaps uh, Tony would be good to open on, open on this question, uh, touching on some things you were talking about earlier. So perhaps Tony? Well, the, the power of the nation states or the power of uh, billionaire dot-coms or other great forces in the world are always a threat to tiny isolated communities everywhere. Um, but I would say as a counterweight to that, you need to understand, and I say to the questioner, the largest landowner in Alaska are the, is the indigenous population. The largest single landowner in the Yukon are the indigenous community. The largest single landowner in the Northwest Territories in Nunavut are the indigenous community. They have now, since the land claim settlements of the early, late 80s, early 90s, now invested in their own lands and their own development such that we have tiny communities here with $100 million development corporations. So the idea that they are threatened by outside interests, I think is, I, I would question that. What they are doing intelligently is creating very important strategic partnerships with people who they regard as allies, natural allies, um, uh, and, and choosing not to partner with people who they regard as threats to their environment or their lands or their waters. And I think, I, then I think indigenous governance means exactly that, that they're gonna make those decisions for themselves. And I would argue in Northern Canada and in Alaska and, and elsewhere, where the indigenous people have a voice, that is happening um, in a way which I think is a counterweight to those other forces. Uh, David, this also touches on what you were, some of the things you've been talking about. So uh, David, do you have some thoughts on uh, on this question as well? Yeah, I think that, uh, and uh, Tony would, as you're more familiar with this than I am, but the unique status of um, Yukon First Nations in comparison to Alaska, where Alaska was organized under the uh, Arctic Native Claims Settlement Act, in a corporatist type model, and um, where in Yukon, it's very much uh, a civilian uh, self-government uh, uh, form of, uh, of government organization. This is where it arose from, uh, from the, the First Nations themselves. And so this tension is playing out in Yukon and, uh, as, and as, as it is in Alaska. Um, and I think that we just have to be aware that that's, that's their space and they have to have the toolkit to address that. But right across the circumpolar north, there is this question, uh, and it's very much a Nordic model, as that we have envisioned the, the market, the state, and civil society as different sectors. And there's tensions between those sectors. And those need to be managed by various structures. And it's a, uh, it's a moving target. And every geopolitical space it is has a you know is a different place on that, and so we have to watch that. Russia, in particular, you saw the rapon coming out and endorsing the invasion, and uh, some rapon members of the, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, this is a very different Ukraine than I met in in Moscow and worked with in the leadership. But uh, that organization, like many organizations, put in trusteeship by um, by Putin's uh, United Russia. So. Um, that's what we, we really have to look at carefully through many different lenses. Perhaps Gabriella next. Sure. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's a hard question to answer. I'm, 
I'm cognizant that um, there's certainly like a big shift coming in terms of economic attention in the Arctic and that it sizably impacts um, indigenous people there first. So my instinct would be, you know, to give more empowerment to those communities, giving them more financial resources, legal resources, anything to give them more of a leg up on these enormous organizations. But I think it's important to point out that that power in those meetings will never be equal, no matter how much support is given um, to these communities. And it's important to recognize that power imbalance um, just from a history of colonialism. And Timo? Yeah, perhaps very quickly, um, this will be discussed in, in, in tomorrow's uh, sessions. It's obviously the, the, the kind of uh, new reality that we are facing is hopefully not such that also the Arctic has, will be seen through the kind of hard security lenses. And they, with that comes also the nation state, also to the Northern Territories. So that's also the, the thing that, that, that I think that we should be watchful and, 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 and also scared. On the other hand, I, I, I personally pointed out that um, still in this situation, we don't see the Arctic as a kind of high tension area. Um, I think that it's, it's also kind of legitimate to, to make a difference to, to Ukraine and also think of what on earth Russia would gain in having military objectives in the Arctic. And perhaps that will be discussed in, in tomorrow's panel. And we already have our keynote, so she knows more, 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 more of these issues. Thanks. Yes, well, we're, our time is at an end. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our panelists. I, I love that. And unfortunately, we could keep going because we have five questions that are in the Q, five or six questions in the Q&A box that we did not get to. I have, I just counted nine questions that I had that I didn't get to ask. So we could talk about this all day. Um, so if I didn't get to your question in the Q&A, uh, my apologies, they were all good questions. So don't think that I didn't like your question. Uh, it's just, you know, uh, time does not allow. So thank you very much for asking questions and thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our panelists. And we will turn now to our, our keynote speaker. Uh, who I'm very excited about. We have uh, Dali Sambo uh, Daro. When we were talking about who we would like to have as a keynote for this two-day event, uh, Dali Sambo Daro was our first choice, and uh, she graciously agreed to give us some of her very busy time. So we were very, very happy about that. Dali Sambo Daro is the elected international chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. She holds a PhD from the University of British Columbia Faculty of Law. She was formerly an assistant professor of international relations within the Department of Political Science at the University of Alaska Anchorage, the chairperson and expert member of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, co-chair of the International Law Association Committee on Implementation of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Executive Director of the International Union for Circumpolar Health, Executive Director of the Alaska Intertribal Council, and many, many more. That is just a sampling. She's also an accomplished author who has uh, authored multiple studies for United Nations bodies and delivered expert testimony in parliaments and legislatures around the world. So if Dali is, uh, is ready to go, I will turn things over. Thank you very much. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm uh, really happy to see uh, longtime friends and colleagues on uh, the screen. And even though it's one dimensional, it's good to, good to see everyone. Um, allow me to preface my comments by indicating that I left a a uh, small drafting group meeting of um, ICC representatives preparing our next General Assembly declaration, which will be considered at our virtual assembly in July, uh, late July. And um, needless to say, it has been somewhat of a challenge to identify priorities and mandates for the coming year because of the current geostrategic, geopolitical issues that we're tackling in, in this particular conference and this era of uncertainty. Before I begin my remarks, um, I want to underscore that 
Inuit as Arctic indigenous peoples bring two really important strengths and qualities to this discussion about the era of uncertainty. I think it's important to say that, that we, since our inception, have been consistently engaged and consistently delivering our messaging at not only Arctic regional fora, but at international fora across the globe. And I say that this is a quality and strength because administrations and, and, and governments outside of our communities are constantly changing. I could extend a full commentary about just the United States and the, and the uneven treatment of, of Arctic issues, yet we have been uh, fairly um, not entrenched, that's, that's not the right word, but the, the, the consistency and, and our constant engagement, not only in our favor as Arctic Indigenous peoples, as Inuit, but I believe in favor of the whole of the world community. Um, the, the second thing that I want to say as a strength or a quality about um, our participation, either in an era of uncertainty or real certainty is coherence and coordination of the issues swirling around the Arctic uh, and how they, also um, are perceived against the backdrop of uh, all of the issues swirling around the, the global community and, and all of humanity. We're the, we're the one force that has been able to bring coherence and coordination. And indeed, since our inception, we have sought uh, coherence and coordination in every Fora, in every intergovernmental fora. Too often we see issues siloed in a way that is not, is unconstructive and, and not helpful in terms of really identifying the challenges that, that face the, the, the world community. And hearkening back to um, our emergence as a indigenous people's organization and even more accurately, a, a non-governmental organization with UN status, uh, which we gained after our inception. I want to go all the way back to the 1977 organizing conference that was held in Reykjavik, uh, Alaska in, in June of 1977. We emerged from the Cold War. That was the political milieu of the day, uh, the Cold War and, and um, the great power competition, uh, certainly um, between the United States and the Soviet Union and the, the, the East and the West, essentially. So we're acutely aware of um, uh, uncertainty and the kind of uncertainty that, that we faced over time. Yet um, we were cognizant of what was at stake in, in this particular context. And I think that the stakes are even higher now uh, for us in our participation uh, in regional initiatives as well as international initiatives. I wanted to quote Eben Hobson when he welcomed our delegates to the assembly in, in Barrow at the time, recognizing that uh, we're having difficulties within Soviet Union. He stated that we Inupiat live under four of the five flags of the Arctic coast. One of those four flags is badly missed here today. Yet it is generally agreed that we enjoy certain Aboriginal legal rights as indigenous peoples of the Arctic it is important that our governments agree about the status of these rights if they are to be uniformly respected. And essentially, uh, he was sort of laying down a, a threshold 
criteria um, to ensure that we have both intellectual and political space at, at every level, but this means that those five literal states, those five coastal states should uh, gain or, or um, behave in such a way that our rights are uniformly amongst all five of them uh, respected and recognized. Um, it took us some time for our relations in Chikatka uh, to join us. Uh, they eventually did. It was significant that we put uh, empty seats at our general assemblies, um, uh, symbolizing their absence from discussion. And today we now face the absence of the Russian Federation writ large in the, the work of the Arctic Council and in a growing number of fora, you know, their suspension from the Human Rights Council, for example, is just one, one uh, item to note. Uh, I also want to share that we've consistently been committed to the Arctic remaining a zone of peace. And this goes all the way back to the adoption of resolution number 11 at that 1977 organizing conference where we called for the Arctic to be designated as a zone of peace. It was subsequently reiterated in 1983 uh, in more detail and more specificity. Uh, it was also uh, included in the Utkavik Declaration in 2018 where we set the mandate uh, for the ICC leadership, including myself, to lay the diplomatic foundation for a dialogue about uh, an, a zone of peace and that, again, that designation. Obviously, we're, we're furthest from uh, that possibility um, in the current conditions. And I think that there are, there are many that are opining over this particular issue of how do we how do we move forward given uh, the, the current conflict? Before any other commentary, I want to um, also make reference to our increasing concern about the Arctic Council and and the fact that there has not, at least even in the in the original Ottawa Declaration, all of the debate and dialogue negotiation about the rules of procedure of the Arctic Council, no one thought of what do we do in the case of, uh, of a conflict of this nature, right? No one, no one foresaw it, no one, no one really understood you know, that this, the potentiality of this, um, which in and of itself is kind of significant, recognizing uh, sort of the birth of the ICC in the context of the Cold War. And it sort of begs the question of, of, um, of the, the purposes of the Arctic Council and the fact that we're not dealing with a full deck of cards, right? In terms of defense and security issues, in terms of economic development issues, the, the initiatives laid down and, and memorialized in the 1996 Ottawa Declaration are indeed significant. We're grateful that the focus and the objective was um, environmental protection, environmental conservation of this distinct region in the world and also the embrace of Arctic indigenous peoples as, as permanent participants. Um, and the also um, kind of a, a significant footnote to all of this, uh, the embrace of uh, the Inuit Circumpolar Council as a permanent participant, as well as the Sami Council, here again, recognizing that we transcend national borders. Uh, that as permanent participants, um, three of the six have uh, membership in the Russian Federation. So the ICC, Alu International Association and the Sami Council. Um, and so this is kind of a, a significant element and, 
and an important footnote to our, our continuing engagement, making it very, very difficult uh, to do so. And so there's a, that for us adds a, a completely different layer of, um, of uncertainty and, and challenges. I will say, however, that even, for example, in the meeting that I left on that desktop computer over there, a Zoom meeting, we did have the engagement of, um, of representatives from Chicago and in particular our executive council members. So we, we again, going back to my comment about the, the, the strengths and the qualities of the ICC, we've been able to maintain our communication, maintain our objectives, maintain our work to move forward on behalf of our membership, despite the imposition of the national boundaries across our, our traditional territory. And I think it's, a, it's an, important, um, an important element of, um, of our work that can't be overlooked. And it also suggests that um, we have uh, an important perspective to overcoming uh, some of the uncertainty that does exist and how we can actually um, hope to propel the continuation of work um, collaboratively and cooperatively. And in the same way that the Arctic Council has been uh, regarded as a, as a collegial and cooperative environment. I think that what we're, what we continue to do should be a, an example and a model for others in terms of continued cooperation. I will say that, that as far as the pause that has been uh, put in place, um, and my review of, of some of the recent developments, the permanent participants um, were not directly consulted about the pause. The Arctic Council has prided itself in inclusion of the permanent participants, um, but to my knowledge and based upon a dialogue at, uh, in, within offices and, and quarters um, uh, much higher than ours, um, that the decision to request a pause and then the subsequent response uh, uh, to the idea of a pause um, was done without any direct consultation with the permanent participants, which to some extent suggests a um, maybe a break in the rules, so to speak, uh, but also uh, are the unspoken rules or unwritten rules to be more accurate. Um, but at, at the same time, uh, it then suggests, okay, when the Arctic Council does come back online, and there are some that are very pessimistic about that, uh, what form will it take? Uh, we ourselves are very keen to, to see, uh, of course, the conflict and the conditions um, to improve, whether it, the, the question about how long that might take is a whole nother matter. Um, but I think that um, our desire is that when it does uh, start to at least hopefully move back into the neighborhood of, of, um, of regional cooperation, that the question of the form that it takes uh, be looked at, both in terms of the the status, rights, and role of Arctic Indigenous peoples of Inuit in this context and increasing and enhancing the role akin to the dialogue that's going on within the United Nations uh, where Indigenous peoples globally are looking at how to increase and enhance their participation in the work of the General Assembly, how to increase and enhance their participation in the Human Rights Council, so that we're not, not just objects, but that we're subjects in those uh, particular uh, fora. So essentially what I'm saying is that if, uh, and I think it's not necessarily if, it's, it's when will we have the opportunity to come back and consider uh, the, the reformulation, the restructuring of um, 
of cooperation and collaboration in the Arctic region overall. Just a couple more things that I quickly wanted to say, and that is um, in terms of the future of uh, regional cooperation and, and Arctic issues, and you know, it's a whole nother thing to talk about the priority areas. I'm pretty, we have been very deliberate and careful about um, identifying the priorities that will set in the, in the next four years. We have a number of clusters of, of um, issues that of course are all interrelated, but how we do it is, is a whole nother matter, um, especially given the, the pause as far as the uh, Arctic Council is concerned. Um, but I wanted to talk about uh, dialogue and, and free exchange of ideas and knowledge uh, not only as a, as a community of Arctic indigenous peoples, but as far as what we understood to be represented by the Arctic Council, and that is, you know, scientists through the six working groups of the Arctic Council, of which four of them we have been active in, again, consistently and, and constantly, um, the, you know, the, the, the four uh, working groups, PAIM, CAF, the Sustainable Development uh, Working Group, and AMAP. Um, and in this regard, uh, and maybe others heard me say this uh, in the International Arctic Science Committee gathering or the Arctic Encounter Symposium, um, I'm kind of taking the cue from the Lancet Commission, the, the Journal on Global Health, and the quandary that they found themselves in um, almost immediately after the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation and the question about whether they should continue to collaborate or accept submissions of papers from, from Russian authors. And I, I think that this, this quote, and I'll read from um, the CEO of Elsevier, the publishing company that owns The Lancet, because I think it's useful in terms of um, the immediate conditions, but also future conditions. The entire scientific community and other companies in our industry are also grappling with these questions. Given scholarly communications do not fall under the current sanctions, this judgment comes down to what is the right thing to do. And there is no obvious answer. We believe it is important to protect the freedom of scholarly exchange as scientific progress depends on researchers being able to collaborate with each other globally and build on new knowledge. Hence, consistent with this principle, we continue to accept submissions of papers with Russian authors and to judge research on its quality without bias. And I think that this is a, to me, it's um, uh, an important element for us to consider in terms of trying to achieve greater certainty uh, in, as far as the Arctic region is concerned. Also in a recent comment by Richard Horton of The Lancet that was published in Science Direct, um, he indicates that the first challenge was that a global pandemic demanded a global science, an international network of scientists able to communicate freely with one another. A second challenge was that global science depends on global trust and global trust depends on open collaboration with scientists in all countries. Scientists must build trust with the other scientists irrespective of their national origin. We must support one another in the face of often hostile political criticism to provide the most reliable evidence to decision makers. And so I share these things because it's, I think it's useful for us to consider uh, the fact that climate change and its deleterious impacts on our communities has not halted or paused. Um, the, the activity that we were concerned about prior to the pause continues, right? You know, the vessel traffic hasn't stopped. Um, uh, the the um, issues of atmospheric pollution, those things haven't stopped. Uh, sure, the IMO, for example, is 
to figure out, okay, how do we how do we implement the polar code in this context? I mean, people are faced with a lot of different questions, but I think that in the end of the day, it really is about doing the right thing, uh, especially especially in relation to the urgent issues facing Inuit and other Arctic indigenous peoples. And so that consistency, that that quality I spoke of earlier, uh, the, the strength of our, of our at least constant and consistent advocacy in, in favor of our communities, that that too uh, continues. And essentially it is based upon at least the way we understand the international legal order and the pillars that have been established within the United Nations uh, peace and security as one pillar, development, sustainable development, another pillar, human rights as a, as a significant pillar, and the environment. If we, if we take into account all four of those um, pillars that undergird the international uh, legal order, I simply want to emphasize the human rights of Inuit, the human rights of Arctic indigenous peoples and the continuing and perhaps one of the most urgent issues facing the world community to respect our human rights, including our human right to self-determination, our human right to participate in matters that affect us and um, all of the interrelated rights that we have uh, advanced in various different and, and increasingly uh, numerous uh, international fora, again, not only for um, our benefit, but for the benefit of humanity and that this great power competition or great power cooperation should not be the the sole condition for Arctic dialogue or, or global dialogue, that we ourselves as Inuit, that we found solutions for maintaining and developing dialogue. Uh, we have sustained it even in the face of this uncertainty. Um, so we're here to make a contribution uh, as well as to continue our uh, level of diplomacy and influence uh, that we face again in this era of uncertainty so that we can um, maintain our own cultural security, our own Inuit security uh, in, in the face of uncertainty. I hope that I've been responsive to the, to the invitation and um, maybe there are some things that um, can be considered as you go forward, uh, not only in this dialogue, but my guess is that there, the, the numerous dialogues that each of you as, um, as panelists and other conference participants are uh, undoubtedly engaged in uh, as Arctic enthusiasts. So, Kianak, thank you. Well, yes, thank you very, very much for those excellent and very informative comments. Uh, I learned many things. I wish I could stay here all day and ask questions and pick your brain, but our time is at an end. So thank you very, very much for agreeing to give that address. And I, I no doubt that all of the participants, if we were together, would be giving you a rapturous round of applause right now. But this is the this, one of the disadvantages of Zoom is that you can't hear all of our, our virtual applause. So yeah. Yeah. thank you. Thank you very, very much. Nope, nope, thank you and uh, Tony, Timo, others. Um, and good luck with your uh, gathering uh, tomorrow where I know Rebecca and, and others will contribute. And my apologies for not being able to uh, remain engaged uh, due to other responsibilities, but good we luck. We know you have a, a very busy schedule and many responsibilities. So we, we really appreciate you taking this time to, to talk to us. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. And, uh, and with that, we uh, our time to get together today is uh, is at an end so we are back uh we are back tomorrow for the second day of our of our event of our discussions 
Uh, we'll pick back up tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern time, talking about uh, military consequences of the Russian invasion of Ukraine in, on the Arctic. And then at 10.45, about economic and social consequences. So I'm really looking forward to those events. And maybe to add, I would like to, to thank, yes, all our panelists and, and, and to our keynote, yes, Doro, laying out the dilemmas the communities are facing contribution, but I also like to thank uh, Andrew for a uh, masterful moderation of, uh, of, of this panel. So thank you, uh, thank you, Andrew. Again, we would <laughs> um, uh, all applaud in person, maybe it's for next year, probably. Um, but thank you, Andrew, for a great job uh, today. Uh, like Andrew said, tomorrow, nine uh, Eastern time. I know we're in different time zones. So <laughs> Um, uh, important to remember, um, we're going to start a new. Uh, we divided it into two days because we know of screen fatigue. After a while, we tend to our mind kind of drift. So uh, that's why we segmented into, uh, into two days. So on this note, thank you very much for all coming. And I hope to see you and Andrew and everybody uh, tomorrow at 9 for the military path.